Welcome back to another 2022 year in review. Today's episode, we are going to be looking at the new Democratic Party and everything that has held the uh, everything that's been in store for them for 2022, but also heading into 2023, what it's going to look like for the party. And to do that, we wanted to bring back our guest of the us. Uh, most respect the former NDP candidate for Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan, because I always get that those two mixed up and I reverse them every single time. Aiden Tiro. Bam! Got your name right, man. Aiden, how are you? <laughs> I'm doing just fine. How are you doing, Chris? Not too shabby, not too shabby. So we're going to be talking about the NDP, what the highs, the lows, and where the party is going to be going in 2023. So I got to start with this, the big question, federally. This is the federal NDP we're talking about here. Aiden, you ran for them in 2021. How did you think their 2022 went? Well, I think 2022 was a very interesting year for the party, a uh, very eventful year. Uh, I think they were able to get a lot of stuff done, even given the uh, somewhat limited uh, amount of power they have in Parliament. Uh, I think they did a great job leveraging it with that supply uh, and confidence agreement. Yes, which is a supply and confidence agreement, not a coalition for the record. Uh, it does not meet the definition. Um, but, um, but yeah, no, I think uh, the recent uh, dental care plan, um, you know, I think that was a huge step in the right direction for getting people access to dental care. Uh, you know, I would like to see us keep pushing uh, further on that. Uh, you know, I think there is still uh, more to go, but I, I do think, um, you know, giving this uh, uh, access to low in, uh, children of low income families is a huge step in the right direction. Moving forward, uh, yeah, I think we definitely want to be pushing on uh, pharmacare, uh, expanding pharmacare and uh, moving us closer to public pharmacare. Uh, but yeah, all, all in all, I think this was a strong year for the NDP. I want to take us back to January and February of 2022, and that was when Ottawa was under, I don't want to say siege, but they had a massive protest outside of the parliament buildings. Uh, a few weeks was ended in the Emergency Act being introduced and being passed by the Liberals and uh, I think One Green and the NDP. Um, how did you think your party held, uh, did in that situation because there was a little bit of a pushback where um, Tommy Douglas didn't allow it when Pierre Trudeau used it, but Jagmeet Singh was allowing it because of the situation in 2022 in 2022, January. So for you, how did you think uh, Jagmeet handled that whole situation in uh, January and February? I personally, for me, I'm, I have no issue using the word siege uh, in relation to the, to that catastrophe. But uh, but part that's of... why you're the guest, <laughs> and I'm the host. <laughs> yes, uh, but um, no, I think uh, you know I do think Jagmeet did the right thing. It was an incredibly unfortunate situation. Uh, you know, in theory, in a perfect world, the Emergency Act wouldn't have been used. Um, but when you see this complete, and what we're seeing now is there was a complete breakdown in the police, you know, the provincial government's just complete unwillingness to respond to it. Um, yeah, I think it, it was a necessary measure. It was not, uh, it was done all out in the open. Uh, you know, all of these institutions knew what was happening. Um, you know, and I think, uh, and the other thing too, and I know this was a point brought up by many people as well, Tommy Douglas opposed uh, the use of the War Measures Act by Pierre Trudeau in response to the FLQ crisis. Um, I do think it is important to draw the distinction that the Emergencies Act is a separate uh, piece of legislation. It was put in place to replace the War Measures Act. It was actually the Conservatives that um, put the Emergencies Act in place, ironically enough. Um, but uh, yeah, you know, I think it's important we're having this inquiry, but uh, I, I do think in the moment, had I been in Parliament, I would have begrudgingly voted yes. This is the first year where two NDP MPs have been elected from Alberta, both in Edmonton with Blake Desjardins. Uh, I forget. I forget how to pronounce his last name, but him, Blake and Heather, uh, both from Edmonton, Edmonton Greasepa, if I'm not mistaken, and also Edmonton Strathcona. Um, this must give sort of somewhat of a wind at their back here for heading into the, a potential next election in 2025 when the supply and confidence agreement runs out. Uh, how did you think locally the NDP did with the two uh, MPs in uh, the House of Commons, but also here locally? Did you see them out in Fort Saskatchewan? in Sherwood Park or were they staying close to home? 
Well, they definitely, uh, you know, it, it's sort of funny. And I think now the uh, the load has been spread between uh, Heather and Blake, uh, where before I, I remember all of, you know, NDP constituency associations. I think every time Heather was back from Ottawa, it was just this pulling left and right. You know, we were all we all kind of wanted a piece of her. And we all did get a piece of her. She was uh, very good at working with all of us. And Blake has been fantastic. I mean, we've had him uh, in our EDA, uh, Sherwood Park Road, Saskatchewan, NDP for uh, a number of events. Uh, Sam, I'm so involved with the McEwen University NDP. He's uh, been great. Uh, uh, you know, he's come up to our promotional tables, uh, you know, done little events, uh, answered a lot of questions on uh, issues students had. Um, yeah, they've uh, they've done absolutely fantastic uh, community work, uh, you know, and I think uh, and especially, I mean, Blake, I mean, this this guy is a rising star. You know, I got to meet him during the campaign and yeah, I, I really like what he's doing. Uh, so I think locally he's going to be a very strong uh, uh, MP moving forward and moving forward to, uh, after the next few elections. Do you do you hear people on the grounds in uh, Fort Saskatchewan and Sherwood Park, but also across Alberta, talking about how they're potentially open to the idea in 2022 to looking at the NDP as a viable option moving forward? Because you you have two MPs, you have the ability to do a little bit more communications besides Heather being pulled in all these different directions. Are people looking at the NDP in Alberta and saying, okay, well, we have two strong MPs in Ottawa. Why don't we send a third or a fourth? I absolutely think that that's possible. In fact, uh, you know, Heather McKenzie, who ran in, oh gosh, I forget the writing. I'm, I want to say Edmonton Center, City Center. I forget. The the, the provincial and federal writings are a bit different, but she, she ran... Uh, Edmonton against, Center. Uh, Edmonton Center, thank you, thank you. Randy Bossino. Uh, Randy Bossino, and that's where he, but that ended up being a real three-way race. Like, really, if, if a number of liberal votes or conservative votes had gone NDP, she very well could have been the MP as well. So I think, uh, I think there, you know, and I think various rides across the province. You know, one thing we really noticed was that um, even in ridings where the conservatives won, like in my riding, for instance, um, you know, not to boast or anything, but our our campaign did come in <laughs> did come in second. But that was boast uh, away, campaign. Aiden. Boast away. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'll, I'll boast about the NDP because uh, yeah, they performed quite well in Alberta. Um, you know, many rides had the NDP uh, as sort of the opposition candidate to the Conservatives. So I think a lot of people are starting to see the NDP as the viable alternative. I mean, the Prairies was really where. Uh, the NDP CCF movement started, you know, prairie populism. And and I think moving forward, you know, some folks are kind of realizing these conservative policies, this right wing status quo here in Alberta is just not doing it for, for them. And I, I think uh, the NDP is offering a real good progressive alternative. While I don't want to talk about provincial politics, because we're here talking about federal politics, I, I do have to ask the elephant in the room question. How much of that has to do with Rachel Notley and how much of that has to do with Jagmeet Singh? Because here here in Alberta, Rachel Notley is very popular. She is popular with Albertans. She is the anti-Jason Kenney, anti-Daniel Smith vote. How much of that federal NDP I I won't say loving, but how much of that NDP federal bump is uh, re uh, determined because of Rachel Notley, or is it actually Jagmeet Singh? Well, I think there's definitely bits of both. I mean, with uh, you know, uh, you know, one of the big things Blake had to, going for him in his campaign was that uh, you know many uh, NDP MLAs here in Alberta, especially Janice Irwin, uh, were really out there on the doors, uh, you know, helping him uh, get his message out there. Uh, so you do see a you know a bit of uh, overlap between the two interests. Um, I do think there is definitely the uh, you know kind of the NDP brand, you know, the orange color. Uh, is definitely in a surge. Uh, and some of that, definitely a lot of that probably is due to the anti uh, Kenny and anti Smith uh, sentiment uh, that's really growing in a lot of Alberta. And there's only two viable parties that are going to uh, uh, realistically get uh, vote or get seats in the next election. So likely, you know, the NDP. Uh, but I don't want to necessarily say it's entirely based on the provincial stuff. I think people do, you know, People do recognize the difference between the federal and the provincial, and I think when people look federally, you know, uh, you know, a lot of polls come out showing Jugmeat more popular here in Alberta than Trudeau. I think when people are looking for a federal alternative to say this, you know, uh, new new strand of pretend populism from Pierre Poutiev, um, you know, I, I think uh, the NDP and what Jugmeat are offering is better solutions for workers. Uh, I, I do think I do think that is part of it. Um. 
over the summer, we sort of were thrust upon a national, uh, sorry, international war in Ukraine and Russia, which has put a spotlight on what we need to do from a Canadian's perspective to help Ukraine refugees, which is allow them in and settle them, but also looking at our resources because heating and hydro heating bills are going up, natural gas is going up. Um, the economy is so I don't want I don't I, I want I I hate to say it this way because I hate using talking points from other parties, but here we are. I'm gonna use them anyway. The war in Ukraine, the war in Russia is influencing the economic drive that is happening here in Canada. Um now the House of Commons has put a lot of emphasis on the economy this year with it being the rise in inflation with the housing with the housing prices with food prices going up the ndp put forward a motion to look into retailers role in the price of inflation on food and i i know that's a long way to go from you born ukraine to here but it all is connected in some way this was a major win for the ndp why is this so important for the NDP to continue talking about this stuff going into 2023 when we don't see an end to this inflation crisis? Well, it's going to be important because at the end of the day, people, you know, they're going to care about those pocketbook issues, those kitchen table issues. And people are looking for, okay, what is... You know, we're in this crisis right now, and it's because of a variety of global factors, not the least of which, of course, being Russia's invasion of Ukraine. And OK, what is causing this? What can we do to mitigate this? Um, you know, and you have different, you know, you have the liberal government who oftentimes will essentially throw their hands up in the air and say, well, you know, it's kind of. Not it's, our, it's not our issue, that. not our fault. No. We're not going to deal with it. <laughs> that, that, that is kind of the attitude you do see them often take. Uh, and then you have Pierre Pariev and the conservatives who will, you know, propose these magic wand solutions like, oh, well, you can just opt out of inflation with Bitcoin. And then what happens? Oh, the value of Bitcoin plummets. And now anyone who listened to his advice is now uh, hurting even more financially. Um, so out of these, you know, I think the NDP looking at what role corporations are are playing in this, you know, are they exploiting this crisis uh, to jack up prices uh, in order to make record profits in order to, uh, you know, increase, uh, uh, you know, their uh, shoring out dividends and so you know looking at grocery stores i mean the most vital services for people to be getting you know prices jacked up like that um you know people it is utterly necessary that we hold these companies accountable we make sure are these prices actually reflecting what the global market situation is um you know is that or is, is that a winning scenario though for the ndp is that a winning scenario because uh, and I and I, I listen to a lot of different perspectives. Yes, for those who are about to yell at the screen, I do from time to time read Rebel News. I read True North. I read the Globe and Mail. And yes, I love my CBC. So I read them as well because I want to get a, a cross section of what's happening in the world so I can be better informed. Do I think some of it's trash? Hell yes. That being said, is that a winning formula for the NDP to talk about the big grocery stores when, to me, that my issue isn't with the grocery store. My issue is, OK, how can I put food on my table right now? Right. Like, it just seems weird for me, weird for the, the NDP to look at the grocery stores and not talk about the big issue is how do we get more money into the pockets of people? Well, and that's one of the reasons why the NDP, you know, for instance, they proposed uh, removing the GST on uh, housing, uh, you know, uh, house heating. It's, um, you know, taking, we need to first, uh, you know, and taxing the windfall profits uh, gives us the money, you know, the government, the money, to, the tools to actually help, uh, you know, put in programs to help people get through this crisis. Um, you know, this idea we're going to cut and cut out of this issue is just, it's just not going to happen. I mean, look how well, that's working under the UK and the Conservatives there. Um, you know, and I think people, the frustration isn't with grocery stores themselves, you know, the workers, uh, you know, uh, doing incredible work, uh, you know, to help people get what they need. Uh, but the issue is when you have, uh, you know, large corporate executives who make these decisions, uh, you know, that, that does frustrate people. And I think, you know, pointing out that, 
that if there if there is exploitation happening in uh, that is driving uh, this inflation crisis, uh, that that needs to be addressed by the government. The government needs to use the tools at its disposal to do so, uh, and also help while simultaneously helping people get through this crisis. And so I think the NDP has a lot of proposals that uh, go towards doing that. Oh, uh, sorry, I can't. Uh, there we go. It would help if I uh, <laughs> unmute myself after I cough, but that's the go. way the world works here. That's the thing right. about live to air shows. So anything could happen. Um, I, I want to ask the question that I think a lot of people are thinking to themselves, and I am one of these people, is putting yourself into a supply and confidence agreement with a, the governing liberals might have been a good move because it allows stability going forward, but it also touch you off at the legs because now you are going to be voting for non-confidence agreements, budgets, uh, like speech from the thrones and all that. And you're not going to be able to put forward uh, an, an official attack and say, well, this budget's going to be bad for the people when you are going to turn around and vote for it anyway, doesn't it? Because I think that's my big issue with the NDP this year. And I think there's a lot of people in this thinking that as well saying, how can you support a government through a supply and confidence, but not agree with everything that they're saying? Well, there has to be give and take, and that's how parliaments are supposed to work. It's not just what? whoever happens what? to... What are you talking about? There's no give and take <laughs> in I know, politics. I know. It's, Come on, it's Aiden. Good. <laughs> good politics. They're angry politics. Um, but yeah, no, I think uh, like definitely politically there, there, there is some capital being paid for sure. Um, you know, it is tougher to... Uh, you know, to hold uh, Mr. Trudeau's feet to the fire when then the voting record shows we supported, say, the budget, for instance. Um, you know, and my, and it's a tough situation, but you have to look at it like, do we want to just be the conservatives on the left who just stomp their feet but don't actually get anything done? You know, or or do we actually? accomplish things for Canadians. And I think the messaging that the NDP has been putting out there has done a pretty good job of illustrating that, you know, this dental care program, it would not be happening if the NDP hadn't uh, pushed this agreement and pushed the Liberals uh, to act on it. You know, and that's the thing. These, you know, good policies are happening because the NDP is pushing the Liberals. And so I think that messaging is important. Uh, and, you know, and just getting it out there that, yeah, like these are, this is the kind of direction where if you want to see more of these uh, kind of policies that help people vote NDP. Um, so I think uh, so. I think that, that that's definitely a big uh, big part of it. But getting so are, some you, stuff are you done. are you hearing from people like even through your friends through your uh, through McEwen or in Sherwood Park uh, for Sherwood Park Fort Saskatchewan? Can I get that name right? I'm gonna yeah, get it. Yeah. Sherwood Park Fort Saskatchewan, <laughs> where they're saying we we want to vote for the NDP, but hey you guys are siding with Justin Trudeau and you talked, you literally said earlier in the interview, Jagmeet Singh is pulling better than Justin Trudeau, but now you're tied to Justin Trudeau. <laughs> so it might be bringing you down a bit. Yeah. there, Then that is definitely the political capital you pay. Um, you know, I think Jagmeet, I, when, when the supply and confidence agreement started, he did a, I think a really good interview with CBC where he said, I mean, look, you know, I believe we can make the case to Canadians that the NDP is the way uh, to vote going forward, despite, uh, you know, this temporary somewhat alliance. I mean, again, the, the NDP still put forward motions to the Liberal side with the Conservatives to vote down. Uh, you know, they've, they, they've, they've done so several times recently. Um, so it, there is still, I think, a clear difference between the two parties and what they're offering. And I think in election time, especially, you're going to see those differences, um, you know, made very clear. But uh, but on the ground, I mean, again, I think it does come down to that here the NDP is seen more as the real alternative to conservatives, not uh, the Trudeau liberals. Now, I, I, I want I want to turn to the MPs, the NDP caucus right now, because you have had a fantastic year where a lot of the I, I don't want to say unknown MPs, but some of the ones that are lesser known to people were able to break out and actually make a little bit of a uh, statement. Uh, I, I forget her name. She's from uh, mm, Port Moody Coquitlam. Benita Zem, Z something. Anyway, BZ is her initials. So, and I've wanted to have her on the show. She's a former counselor. And hopefully after seeing this, she'll really want to show. Um <laughs> 
I want to take Jugmeet Singh out of the equation here for a second. Looking at your NDP caucus that you are a part, not a part of, but you uh, you look up to because you wanted to be an MP. Is there an MP that's in that caucus that you go, you know what, they had a fantastic year? Who's the MP that you look at and you say, they had a good year? I mean, my personal bias is to say Blake, but I've already I've already sung his praises earlier, so I should. Uh, <laughs> should you think he had years. a good year? How so? How how like I I saw him a few times in question period. How well how well do you think he did? I think he did really good. I mean, this, of course, being his first year as an MP, you know, after coming off the heels of an early election, uh, to suddenly basically being thrown into the deep end as being one of two um, uh, new Democratic MPs in Alberta. Uh, you know, I think he's done a great job, uh, you know, pushing forward on important issues uh, regarding both Métis uh, and Indigenous folks, uh, you know, and just progressive issues in general. And, you know, and I think I've seen a real commitment to progressive ideals from him. I was... Uh, uh, you know, quite pleased to see that, uh, you know, he's really sticking to his uh, to his well, progressive guns, for lack of a better term. Um, I guess as far as uh, other MPs, I mean, again, I have a lot of uh, great things to say about, you know, Peter Julian, Don Davies. Um, you know, I think uh, Leigh Gazin, I, I, I always worry. She has been making her. a lot of news lately. Like she is in the news a lot lately, actually. And she's talking about housing seniors yes. and it seems like she's very much like the 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 ndp movement is going to more of a progressive movement it seems like would i be incorrect by saying that i think it'd be totally correct and i think it's something we really want to see you know it was something when you look back and you know obviously i i'm i'm still a novice you know i'm still pretty young but uh i think uh you know Tom Mulcair did try to pull the party more to the center because he felt that that was where more electable. And I don't know if that's necessarily the case. And I think it, it's, it's the, the new tone being taken, I think is a good, uh, is a good push, you know, and we've seen like as an, uh, I can, I really hope I'm not mispronouncing her last name, but uh, uh, pushing the issue of guaranteed livable basic income. I mean, this is something we've a uh, conversation that especially with COVID, I mean, it's really kicked up the talk about uh, basic income systems. And so for her to keep uh, pushing that issue, I think is really good. And I think that that's something to really look at in the future. The one I was surprised at this year, and this is uh I, 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 I followed her because uh, Mumalak Quack Quack, the former MP for Nunavut, uh, re retired in 2021. And uh, Lori Edult, I hopefully pronounced that name wrong. And again, we're probably not going to get a lot of NDP MPs on the show after butchering their names, but hopefully they'll still come <laughs> on. Uh, but Lori's been talking a lot about aboriginal issues and in a year when it's talk oh, and northern issues i should say because I, I spoke to the mayor of Iqaluit on the show in october and i can tell you that there's a lot of issues going on in that community in that uh, province territory i should say so it's good to see someone standing up and talking about it but i found fascinating with her is while she's talking about Northern issues, she's making it more of a Canadian centric viewpoint, if that makes sense. So I, I, I it's, she's one that I want to watch in 2023, see if she's able to break out of that backbencher mentality that people always put them on. Because if you're not in the front row, you're nobody in some people's minds. Um, while we can talk about the good, I want to talk about the bad. In your point, in your viewpoint, Aiden, were there any fumbles this year the NDP did? It, there, there's always definitely, uh, you can look back on things. Uh, you know, one thing I was a little, um, I, I, I wish we would have fought a little harder on was uh, keeping... Well, there's a couple things I wish we could have gone. I mean, there's always the, I like it, but we could go further. But that's kind of my 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 mentality. I guess my constructive criticism is, uh, you know, I feel that the the line Jagmeet had drawn in the sand regarding uh, the dental care plan, uh, where, no, you cannot cut it more or this deal is off. Um, I, I felt that that should have been drawn a little sooner, but I'm glad it was drawn when it was um, to not completely gut the, the point of the deal. But, um, you know, also, too, I think, uh, you know, with the gas prices, you know, kind of circling back to that inflation issue for a second, uh, you know, the the NDP and I, I forget the specific MP who had raised this issue, but um, the, the proposal to establish a, a, a federal watchdog on fair gas prices. So uh, to investigate, uh, you know, any arbitrary rises in uh, in gasoline prices. 
uh, by both retailers uh, or the oil refinery prices. I think uh, I think that's something we really should have almost just been screaming from the rooftops. Um, you know, we we because it's not something many people you know there was not there's always talk about you know what do we cut you know oh bank canada needs to raise interest rates but we don't talk about we don't you know and that's why i was really glad to to see that uh, grocery store um price uh, legislation go forward it, is that we need to start looking at okay what role what percent of this is just you know large corporate executives taking off a little extra for themselves and i think with the gas prices right now that that would be a huge issue to push forward so the great thing about my my life is i'm able to multitask while people are talking it was brian macy <laughs> the mp ndp mp who who tried to put forward that motion to mm. have a federal yeah. watcher so brian macy the critic for innovation science and industry and on that note i want to just mention it's bonita Zarle zarello who is the mp for Port Moody, Coquitlam. So there you go. <laughs> I know, Bonita, I apologize. Hopefully you'll come on the show. Um, I'm I'm through both pronunciation as well. So it's yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I'm gonna try. I'm gonna get your reaction to mine here. Where were the Where was the NDP during the summer? It seemed like Jugmeet Singh went missing for a few months. Like like June happened and. I didn't see him or hear anything about him coming to the Calgary Stampede, which is one of those things, even if people hate you, you still show up like Justin Trudeau did. I didn't hear a lot of him touring uh, different areas of Canada. I did see that Charlie Angus, Blake, and I for, think it was another MP, I think it was Heather McPherson, if I'm not mistaken, went up to Fort McMurray. But Jagmeet Singh kind of like evaporated during the summer months and took a hiatus and let his other MPs sort of pick up the ball there. Am I missing something there? Because that if that was true, I think that was a big failure on the NDP's part because he's the leader. He should be out there and going to all these events, even like the Calgary Stampede. I, I, I'm from Calgary and I know you have to go. Even if you don't want to go, you get dragged kicking and screaming to the <laughs> Calgary Stampede. Yeah, I um, oh gosh, I'm afraid I'm not uh, not as quite as informed on that. I, I follow all the social media, so I'm probably a little biased because like when I open Twitter, or Instagram, it's like okay, there's Jack Mead. So I, you know, I'm I'm kind of always seeing his his, uh, his face. <laughs> I do too. I follow him, Maxime yeah, Bernier, Ber Ber Pierre Polyev. Like I follow them, Elizabeth May. For God's sakes, I follow them all, and I can tell you, I, I was like. He recently blocked me on Twitter, actually, but that's a whole other thing. Um, yeah, but uh, do, do you want a hug? Do you want a hug? <laughs> do you want to hug it out there? <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm a little. But you're little right. You, you, you pro like I wasn't looking at it verbatim. Like I wasn't like going, "Oh, where's Jugmeat today?" But I just don't mm -hmm. remember seeing him that much. Yeah, I know because uh, I know Charlie Angus spent a bit of time here in Alberta. I would have liked to have seen because it's you know. Looking at it from that Alberta perspective, I would like to see him make a few more stops in Alberta because I think there is, and I do think this is kind of a blind spot and sometimes for the central uh, uh, party management is, uh, you know, realizing just how Alberta is not ungettable as everyone thinks it is. You know, if we just come out here and talk to people, like I really do think our ideas, you know, for helping workers and, uh, you know, struggling families, I think that that really does hold you know hold water especially now because there is kind of an anti-conservative backlash right now at least towards you know the kind of uh uh leadership we're seeing or lack thereof from uh miss smith mrs smith um but uh yeah you would so like I, to see them more him more here more often I, understandable there are 13 provinces and territories that they have to get to but yeah, yeah. i I can't say that I've seen Pierre Polyev here since he's won the leadership. I can't say that I've seen Justin Trudeau here since he's uh, since well the Calgary Stampede. So <laughs> come to Alberta. We're not exactly. that scary. It's fun. There's lots of stuff here. It's a good um, time. I want to end this segment with the encapsulating question. Looking back on the last twelve months for the NDP. Rated on a scale of one to ten, one being bad, ten being good, like it was their best year that they've ever had. How would you rate this year for the NDP? I would have to give this um, 
you know, and we're kind of setting up for the, the following year. So maybe I'll have to do this again uh, next year. But uh, <laughs> what? I, think I, could... <laughs> I think I'd have to give it somewhere somewhere between a seven and an eight. I think I think they've done a pretty good job of leveraging what power they, they do have at the moment. And hopefully in the next federal election, we can get a little few more seats and maybe have a little more uh, to leverage. Um. I'm going to give it probably about a six. I think they did good. I just would like to see more movement and maybe like, I can't tell you if an NDP MP has been to Calgary or Southern Alberta. Understandable. They're being pulled in a lot of directions, but come to Alberta. We, we yeah. do, we do have people down here. So like, I think they did well in the house of commons. They got their point across. They held to economic issues it's just I want to see a presence, and I know times are tough right now when fundraising could be hard, but let's show a presence in this country that people might actually go, hey, they're actually out and about. Well, and, and also to my uh, my MP, uh, Garner Jenis, um, who I ran against, he right. um, in, in a uh, exchange regarding carbon capture, uh, Mr. Jenis uh, offered to give uh, – Mr. Singh, a tour of our carbon capture here and said he would pay for his hotel. And, you know, I'm thinking, well, this is a great opportunity for him to come out to Sherwood Park, Fort Saskatchewan. You know, Do if, a fundraiser. If our, if our MP is going to finance our uh, activism, our campaigning against him. I say, let's go for it. Let's go for it is <laughs> true. Um, so let's turn to the next year. We are almost done we are recording this a little bit earlier than it's being aired but it's being aired in december so uh we are hopefully knock on wood uh gonna be making it through 2023 who knows with everything going on in the world what do you what are you looking for for the ndp in 2023 what are you looking at in 2023 for the ndp well i really want to see them pushing the liberals uh, well on a number of issues um, I think a big one is going to be pharmacare. Uh, you know, healthcare coming off the COVID-19 pandemic, which we are still in a pandemic, but um, I, I, I think, you know, when you look at this issue, this is something that's been promised many times over the years by the Liberal Party. This is, you know, moving towards, taking a step towards pharmacare anyway, um, is in the agreement. And so I think trying to push the Liberals as far in that direction as possible, given that, I mean, you know, they, they themselves held a, uh, had a committee uh, in 2019, look into the prospects of pharmacare, and the committee recommended implementing public pharmacare. So I think that personally, that would be a big uh, peace of mind issue for me. I uh, would be pushing them, but just a many great deal of other things, and you know, and and showing some love to uh, you know the uh, perspective of a guaranteed level basic income. I think policies like that are going to uh, uh, be strong with a lot of people. We we are coming up to the one year anniversary of the signing of the supply and uh, confidence agreement. Um, it is supposed to last until 2025, four years after the last election. So it would put us into a 2025 four year minority government. Jagmeet Singh has said if the government doesn't basically accept some of the things that they want, dental care, pharma care, he's willing to pull the trigger and go to an election. Um, do you believe that this, uh, supply and confidence agreement can last till 2025 with the way that Justin Trudeau has been handling himself in the government so far? It's very tough to speculate. I mean, you know, I, when, when it was, but that's signed, what we do on our show. That's my what show. We, do. we speculate just for the sake speculate. of speculating. <laughs> well, I will do some speculating then. Um, you know, it's. I had this cautious optimism about it, and I, and I think I still have the same view where the liberals, I mean, look, they've they've made many promises and they've broken many promises. So it wouldn't be unconscionable for, uh, to me uh, for them to say, ah, you know what? Uh, ah, we don't need to do anything about pharmacare. Ah, we don't need to do anything about this or that. Um, so can, do I think it can last? Absolutely. I would, I would hope it would. Uh, you know, and I'm sure many Canadians, the last thing they want is another early election after uh, already having one last year. But um, yeah, it, it, it's, it's going to be tough to see. I, again, I remain cautiously optimistic. I don't know if I trust the Liberals, but I do, I think, uh, <laughs> I think if the NDP can keep leveraging its power and keep drawing that line in the sand, I think they can put the pressure on. 
Well, it sounds like you and I are both in the exact same position. I can't, I, I don't see how this lasts until 2025. Do I think it's going to fall in 2023? Do I see a situation where Trudeau pulls the trigger and goes to an election? I don't know. I honestly can't say yes or no to that, but I can say that I don't think it's going to be Jagmeet Singh or the NDP who pulls the plug on the agreement. I think it's going to be the liberals who pull the plug on the agreement. And just saying that because they've been in power for seven years, I see what's happening, right? I see the good, the bad, and the ugly that the liberals have brought in. And I don't see how them being sort of, pigeonholed it by the NDP in 2023, 2024 is good for them because they want to win for themselves and not win on the ideas that the NDP have brought forward. Right. Yeah. I mean, all I would say, I suppose is in, if, if I were talking to, you know, the liberals, all I'd say is, well, how'd that work out for you in 2021? I mean, polls were, you know, they, they, they triggered the election mid pandemic uh, because the polls were looking good for them. Uh, well, it turns out that, the reason the polls were looking good was because people were happy with the stability that appeared to be being offered during a difficult crisis. And for them to then capitalize on that and force everyone to the polls early, uh, they definitely, um, they paid the price and that they didn't get the majority government they were looking for. So how, do I think that, you know, maybe they've learned their lesson from that? Uh, tough to say. It's tough to say. I don't, uh, you know, sometimes I do question the decision making of uh, the people around Mr. Trudeau uh, with those kinds of things. So you know, it'll be be uh, it'll be tough to see, but I can definitely uh, see that angle of them wanting to uh, look for their chance to head out the back door and oh, we get a majority government now. Now we don't have to work with anybody. Now we can go back to our days in 2015 where we did whatever the hell we wanted to, and look where that got yes, you guys. Yes. Um, <laughs> Aiden, I want to thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me tonight or today for those who are listening to this on the day that it airs not the day that we're recording this and it's the middle of the afternoon evening, but thank you so much for sitting down and chatting with me because it's always a pleasure to have you on the show. Um, Thank you. Thank you, Chris. No, absolutely. Always pleasure to be on. Um, And I also want to say I, you, you have been instrumental in this show. You, You came on in 2021 twice, once for the federal election recap, once for, um for your own episode uh and um for those who know i've been going through some health issues and i'm going in for surgery on december 2nd and people like aiden are the reasons why i continue the show uh you bring some joy to the show every time that you come on and i will certainly have you back on in 2023 when we are all better and everything's happy hanky dory day in my life so thank you aiden for being a good friend a good uh commentator to come on the show and a good person just all around so thank you i really appreciate that chris and same to you and seriously man anytime you want me on here i awesome coming on i'm putting you on the list of people that i can contact if i'm ever in a jam um aiden thank you so much for sitting down and talking about the ndp in 2022 and what what what's in store for 2023 um so with that as i say always Put down social media. I know I just said we follow all those politicians, but put it down for five minutes and go have a conversation with somebody. You'd be surprised at how much you learn about people when you actually talk to each other. And with that, have yourself an excellent day. And remember, everyone, keep talking. 